Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Does anybody know what genre of movie added 402 actual separate films to its class back in between 2003 and 2011? Anybody know what genre of kind of movie? I didn't know this either. And I actually kind of I watched quite a few of these kind of movies. No, actually, I thought it would have been, considering Marvel and Disney and all the crazy stuff that went on with them. Zombies. Zombie movies added, added 402 new movies to their genre in eight-year period. There are total, if we look at the total number of uh, zombie movies that have been, ever been made, it's 576. So basically, 80% of them were made during that time period. We're a weird culture, don't you think? <laughs> we love zombies. At that point in time, now it's died down. The earliest one was actually in 1932. It was called White Zombie. It was about a man who fell in love with a woman and made her into a zombie so that he could keep her. And I think it goes downhill from there. Now you're asking, why is he talking about zombie movies? Notice I didn't put any zombies on the screen. I didn't have somebody dressed up coming in as a zombie. I thought about it, though. <laughs> Uh, why am I talking about zombie movies? Well, because I, I have, I have a, a, whenever I think of these verses that we're going to talk about today, and we're only going to talk about basically three verses today. Well, we're going to cover three verses in Ephesians. We'll have others that we look at. As, whenever I think about these, this is what comes to my mind. Because without Christ, if it wasn't for Jesus, you and I would be spiritual zombies. Spiritual zombies. Walking around in a world full of spiritual zombies. That's where we would be. We were, and many people still are, the true walking dead. Now, up to this point uh, in Ephesians, Paul has, has had, this, had this explosion of praise in verses uh, 1, through, or 1, 13 through 14, especially for being chosen, for being being predestined, for being sealed for eternity. And he's talking about inheritance. And in verses 15 through 23, he, he shares how, how he's been praying for the church, what he prays for, what he wants them to be able to see, wants them to understand the resurrection, understand the power that God has and the power that you and I have when we're in Christ. And to look at all that God has done, all that God is doing, looking at the world instead of from our zombie eyes, to see it from the world that God sees. So what's going to happen now is Paul's going to begin to explain the human condition. You know, why, why does he pray what he prays? What is, the, what is the human condition? And then next week, we're going to talk about what's the answer to that human condition. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Again, I'm going to ask that you stand as in honor and in, in reverence to God's word. And here's what Paul writes. He says, and after he's prayed, he's, he's, he's pray, telling him what he prays for. And you were dead in the trespasses of your sins. Hence, zombies. 
spiritual zombies, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience, among whom all we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Father, we praise you, and we thank you, Lord. Open our eyes to what we are dealing with here. What is our condition as we look forward to next week when we see what the solution is? We pray this in your name. Amen. Have a seat. You know, there are times when I think all of us have inflated in opinions of ourselves. I think sometimes we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And, and many times, in order to maintain that level of uh, self-absorbed perception, we compare ourselves to other people. Well, <laughs> at least I'm not like that. You know, I, I have my problems, but at least I'm not that. You know, we think we're pretty clean. We think, you know, I'm not, I'm not such a bad person. I, I, haven't, I haven't killed anybody. I, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't committed adultery. I, I haven't, uh, haven't stolen anything. I, I you know, I, 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 I take care of my mother, my father, my family. I'm a pretty good person. We're kind of like the Pharisee in Luke 8, 11, who's standing there in the temple and he's praying. And he says, oh, Lord, thank you so much that I'm not like that tax collector. I think we're more like that than we like to admit. In our self-evaluated status, we, we find it hard to understand that the wrath of God is upon us. And we find it hard to understand that we need a Savior. And it's not just a problem in the church. I think it's a problem in our society. I think in our society, in our world today, and we're going to talk about worldviews. I'm excited to talk about that because I've been studying that a lot recently. I think, I think we, we think that, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not. Why would, why would God want to give me wrath? What, why, what have I done to deserve this? Why would I need a Savior? The author of Psalm 36 says it really well. It says, Transgressions, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. We, we, can't, we don't see it in ourselves. It, it takes somebody outside of us to show us and when that happens, we can respond in one of two ways. We could either take it and say, yeah, you're right, and humble ourselves, or we can deny it. See, what we need to do is we need to honestly look in the mirror and, and, and look and face the truth and examine ourselves against the mirror of not the person next to us, but against this. What does this say about us? Just to give you an example, Go to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do I have all those? Yes, I do. Am I good at all those? No, I'm not. Do I need to grow in all of those? Yes, I do. We've got to compare ourselves to God's Word because it is the only thing that is true. And yeah, it's painful at times. It is hard at times. God, this week, God has, a couple times, has smacked me right on the back of the head. I don't mean literally, figuratively. He, he said something to me. He had somebody say something to me or directed at me, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. And it wasn't directed, always directed at me either. They said something, I heard it, I read it, I'm like, oh. That's me. It's been a tough week. And it's painful to look at that. But if we want to accurately diagnose where we are, we've got to understand that you and I are spiritually dead. 
We are human flesh walking around dead inside, spiritually. That's how we're born. That's who we are. We're the walking dead. We're zombies, spiritually. Though, you know, if you haven't seen me in the morning, you might think I'm a zombie in the morning too. And the problem is, the reason why we are spiritually dead, and Paul says it here in verses 1 through 3, is because we are being held captive by a trifecta, by three things that are holding us captive. You know, on both on, on political parties, on both the left and the right, we're all afraid that we're going to be, we're all afraid of tyranny. All the people on the left were screaming that President Trump was a fascist and, a, and he, 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 was a, he was a tyrant. People on the right are screaming that the left are tyrants. I think they're both right. I think they are. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not criticizing. I mean, that's just the way it is. But, but we, we're afraid of tyranny. But the amazing thing is that tyranny that could happen in government is nothing. That is child's play compared to the tyranny that you and I are living under right now. The tyranny that Paul talks about in these verses. We live under the tyranny of the ways of the world. We live under the tyranny of the influence of Satan himself. And we live under the tyranny of the wickedness of our own sin nature. Yes, you and I deserve the wrath of God. Not a popular thing to preach today, but I'm going to preach it. And if it wasn't for Jesus and the cross, that's exactly what we would get. <laughs> I remember growing up, you know, when, I, when my dad was at work and my mom was home with us and, and I would do something I wasn't supposed to do and, and mom would say, just wait till your dad gets home. And guess what? When my dad got home, and yes, I did get the belt every once in a while, I deserved every single one of them. You and I deserve wrath. We deserve it. See, when we, when we examine ourselves and we compare it to the word... It doesn't only diagnose how bad we are, it also diagnoses how helpless we are. You know, a doctor had three patients, and they all three had heart problems, so they had all had come in at about the same time, around the same time, and he, he checks them, he does, does a heart scan, does an echocardiogram, does all the tests, does blood tests, does everything, and they all have the same problem, a bad heart. So he brings the first guy in. He says, listen, I got some good news and I got some bad news. What do you want? He said, I want the bad news. The bad news is you're going to die. If you, have, you have a bad heart. You, you have not been taking care of yourself. You smoke, you drink, and you've been eating the wrong things. By the way, well, I'm not going to go there. don't have time. I don't think doctors know that much anymore. I've lost my faith in the medical profession, but that's okay. But this doctor did. He said, you're eating the wrong things. And if you don't, that's the bad news. The good news is I have a surgery that we can do that will extend your life. Because if you don't do the surgery and you don't change your life, you're going to be dead in a year. And the guy says, outrageous. How could you criticize me? How dare you? I came in here for you to reassure me. I came in here for you some encouragement. And what do you do? He made me feel terrible. It's a disgrace. And he storms out of the clinic. Second guy comes in. Doctor tells him the exact same thing. This guy says, huh, really? How dare you? you? You think you're telling me my heart needs surgery? I'll find another doctor, and that doctor will tell me everything's fine. Because, uh, hey, I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm a lot healthier than some other people I know. You're the most arrogant doctor I have ever heard and ever seen. Storms out of the office. Third guy comes in. Doctor tells him the same thing. He sits there quietly for a moment. Says, doctor, I want to thank you first of all. It's a terrible shock to find out that you've got a heart problem and that you're going to die. 
but I appreciate the truth. So why don't we, you know, there is good news. So why don't we sit and why don't you talk to me about this surgery and how I can change my life so I can live. See, we respond to the truth that we are deserving God's wrath in one of those three ways. We are one of those three patients. It's a heart problem. And we're going to die. We're already spiritually dead with that. But there's good news. That good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we just listen to it, not be so arrogant. Paul has diagnosed, uh, diagnosed us as being spiritually dead from birth, eternally separated from God. We deserve wrath, and we deserve to spend eternity in hell. Now, we, we may have an intellectual uh, understanding of the concept of God. That's very common today. And we may have practiced more some religions at some time in our past. But what I understand is it takes a personal relationship with God. It takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the surgery that we need that's going to extend our lives. In our Western culture, we, we think that people are becoming more and more spiritually hungry. And they are. Believe me, they are. But the problem is, is what sometimes seems like spirituality is very much so more self-reflective. Or what seems to be, people are being more religious. More religious. It cannot mean that people are really moving towards God because they're all spiritually dead. And without Jesus, you go on being spiritually dead. He is the only cure. You cannot meditate enough to make yourself spiritually alive. You're still spiritually dead. You can't do yoga enough to make yourself spiritually alive. You're still spiritually dead. You can't chant words to make yourself spiritually alive. You're still spiritually dead. Without Jesus, there is no hope. And we know that because corpses do not get hungry and corpses do not move. No matter what Hollywood shows us in the movies. And Paul says, the reason why we know this, why it's evident in our lives that we are spiritual zombies is because of the lives that we live with the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, where we are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He's talking to Christians here. He's talking to people in the church who proclaim to be believers. And he's saying, you're just like them. Just like them. We've broken the laws of God. Now you might say, oh, Pastor, no, 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 no. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm a good person. I, I didn't break any of God's laws. Well, let me give you a few examples. When we place more emphasis and more of our focus in our lives on the good gifts of God, like family, like home, like status, like money, like pleasure, Instead of on him, if you're playing video games more than you're reading scripture, if you're working more hours to make money than more than you're doing scripture, if you're, if you're doing things more by, for yourself than you are for God, then you've broken the first commandment. You've broken the first commandment, which is to love God above everything else. When we look at a man or a woman and we look, look at them lustfully in our hearts, and I don't just mean, I don't, here's the thing, I don't just mean, mean real men and women. I mean, if you're watching TV, and I'm sorry, you cannot avoid it sometimes for things to flash up on the screen. And it may seem innocent. Beach scene, even if they all have one pieces, girls running down the beach, guys running down the beach. Baywatch, Never watched it. Knew better. And you look at them and you think in your mind, you've now committed adultery. Jesus says, if you look at a woman lustfully, 
you've committed in your heart, you might as well you might as well have committed it in person. Don't go to do it, but you might as well have. You've now broken the seventh commandment. When we bear false witness about somebody in gossip, when we don't, when we have a problem with someone and we don't go to them and talk to them about it, instead we just start talking with everybody else about it or bring it up to the whole church before we go through the other steps, we have now broken the ninth commandment. And in turn, we've broken what Jesus says is the second greatest commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself. When we covet other people's bodies, other people's spouses, other people's possessions, we're breaking the tenth commandment. Oh, I don't covet. Really? Oh, I've just done it recently. I'll be honest with you. I'm, on, I'm going to confess my sins one to another. Here we go. My brother and sister-in-law, best sister and brother, just bought a brand new truck. Brand new Dodge truck. Oh, and I sat in it, and I smelled it. Guess what I did the next day? I started looking at Dodge trucks. I started obsessing about it, thinking about ways I could buy a $45,000 vehicle. Huh. Until it hit me, you're coveting. Stop it. Guess what I start seeing on the road everywhere? Brand new Dodge trucks. Guess what I drive by all the time down in Bluffton? The Dodge dealership. Guess what's sitting out there? Four new brand new Dodge trucks. I had, to, I had to ask for forgiveness for that. Nothing wrong with my truck. It's sitting out there right now. It's got some dings and bends in it. Those dings and bends remind me how stupid I am because I'm the one who put them in there. <laughs> Nothing wrong with my truck. Nothing wrong with buying a new truck if that's what you're led, led to do. But what's prompted it was me seeing somebody else with a new truck. I had not confessed that to everybody, anybody else, by the way, so you're the first ones. So we think we don't deserve wrath? Our sins are our failures to love God and love other people. All the commandments, every law that we should be following follows in those two things. We are either loving something more than we love God or we're loving ourselves in something more than we love each other. And we do this because we're held captive by the tyrannies that I mentioned earlier. So let's take a closer look at them. Let's look at each of these. Remember, we had tyranny of the ways of the world. We had tyranny from the influence of Satan and tyranny from the wickedness of our sin nature. Think about them as prison guards, and you're chained to them, keeping us from escaping spiritual death. That's the ultimate goal. Don't you think? Everybody says, what's your goal in life? My goal in life is to escape spiritual death. Because spiritual death means separation from God forever. That's my goal. If you think I'm being too pessimistic, I challenge you. Try to break away from these tyrannies one week without God. Don't ask for his help. Don't ask him to do anything to help you. Ask him to stand and watch to keep you from dying. And try to not fall into these tyrannies. You can't do it. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit, without God. Even us. Even us as believers will not be completely free from these tyrannies until we're standing in front of God in judgment. Because as long as we live, we still have to deal with the world. We still have to deal with Satan. We still have to deal with ourselves. Romans 7, 15 through 18. This is, a quote, this is the verse I quote all the time and always get it wrong because Paul is just, wow, it's, speaking kind of in circles to me, but it makes sense. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. You ever feel that way? It's like, why, why, why did you do that? Right? For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. I know, I know what I should do and I want to do. I want to do that. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I, <laughs> let's see, well, if, I do, if, I do, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. It is good. The law is good. But if I, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. If you find yourself struggling 
to do the right thing, that means you still have sin in your life. And you need to be praying and confessing. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. This is Paul talking here. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. So let's take the first one. Tyranny from the ways of the world. This is, this is what we would call, uh, what I would call our cultural worldview. Now, I want you to understand that these, this cultural, I'm going to talk about three cultural views that we all have experienced, that we're all living in, in one, one of these three. But the biblical worldview is not one of them. Not that we're not living in it, but that it is different. Once we get into the biblical worldview, we think that's what we're living in. We're not influenced just by that. These are the worldviews that influence us. The first one could be termed the traditional worldview. This is not traditional like you think of. Um, it is, but it is the one that we all have experienced. This is the view that it's a social hierarchy is important. Family, responsibility, duty, good works, and the evidence of them are all important. And see, what the Bible does, the Bible ta- challenges this worldview because it states that we are condemned under the law and we need forgiveness. But this worldview says, no, I'm not. I do good things. My family is important. I take care of my family. All these things that we say we do are part of the traditional worldview. But the Bible challenges says, under the law, we need forgiveness. We need the gift of righteousness in our lives that can only be found through Jesus Christ. The traditional worldview are the works of the flesh. I'm going to do everything I can to be a good person. Being a good person doesn't answer it for you. It doesn't take care of it. That's the traditional worldview. You might say this worldview was probably more uh, common after World War II and into the uh, 70s and 80s. It was the prominent worldview. Now, understand, the biblical worldview was on during that, and there's this constant struggle between the biblical worldview and that worldview. Many in the church today still have this worldview. and They're not living by the biblical worldview. The second one is what is called the emergent worldview. The emergent worldview um, makes um, the, asser- the assertion that it's, it's personal autonomy. Okay? Claiming we have the freedom to choose. It's my right. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. I can choose. I can choose this or that. It's not. And you can't judge me based upon anything. Because that's my choice. I can have my own spiritual outlook on my own objects of worship. But the problem with this worldview, it sounds nice. Yes, I choose to be a good person and I choose these things. The problem is we become narcissistic. We become self-loving. And we conveniently become pluralistic, meaning I can choose my own way to God. Idols are power and status, wealth, leisure, sex, pleasure, education, career, family, and children. But the ultimate goal is to please yourself. Counter to the biblical worldview, which is to please God. And see, the problem is, too, that the, the objects of worship in the, the emergent worldview, they take up a lot of our time. In order to be successful in a career, you've got to spend a lot of time in it. Take a lot of sacrificial effort, and in the end, they don't satisfy us. Why? Because they're not God. Only God can satisfy. They'll ultimately lead followers to have cynicism about authority. Now, do you see why we're living in the world we are today? It's because of that emergent worldview. Understand that it it, it progresses through. Each one influences the other. The traditional worldview is kind of an offshoot of a little bit of a biblical worldview, more of a worldly worldview. It's a different worldview that was in place before World War II and World War I. But the traditional worldview led into the emergent worldview, emerging out of. And see, this cynicism that you have, that the person who's in from a, influenced from an emergent worldview, 
The cynicism they have, they have is used by Satan to fan the flame of lies that there is no God. So you have secular atheism. The belief that God does not exist. So the most important thing in human society are governments and organizations. And they cannot and should not be ruled by religious beliefs. That's the emergent worldview. Do you guys see that in the world today? Can you see it? I do. This is probably from the 70s and 80s. It's probably started more in the 60s, kind of the beginning of it. 80s and 90s. The gospel will counter this worldview. With the idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and his rule and his return to judge idolatry. This very much was, it's interesting, you go through and you actually, <laughs> we're, there's, everything's a cycle. In the West, we look at things linearly. We look at it as a straight line. We have the beginning, we have the end. That's not the way things are. Everything's a cycle. Um, the, actually, the Roman Empire was an emergent worldview. World they had the same worldview we had today. Or had, because there's a third one. And this one scares me. No, I shouldn't say that. This one concerns me the most. The third worldview can be termed re-enchantment. I'm starting to hear that word more and more now. Uh, this came out of the New Age movement, postmodernism, re-enchantment, attempts to combine Eastern mysticism, radical environmentalism, one world society, pantheistic nature religions, and many other pagan beliefs. And if you don't think this is happening, it's happening now and it's happening in the Midwest. We are living, if you, if you talk to um, people, experts who know these things, who follow worldviews, the place where the Midwest, going from Wisconsin, Minnesota, on down into Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, it's called Paganistan. There are more pagans in this area than you would believe. You'll see, when you get the annual report, you'll see my, my report, and I tell you, we are living in a post-post-Christian society. We were post-Christian because Christianity was in decline. We are now less than half the society. True Christians. There's a lot of mixtures out there. People mix paganism with Christianity and call themselves Christian. They're not Christian. It's pagan. Came out of the New Age movement, postmodernism. Uh, it, it produces and it promotes this idea of oneness, which sounds, oh, that's nice. We're all one, you know. But this message of oneness in reality is that, number one, nature is God. Number two, the energy of the universe is God. And if nature is God and, then, and, the, and the energy of the universe is God, guess what else is God? You and I. Because we're part of nature. And we're part of the universe. You will be like God. Sound, sound familiar? It's the lie from the garden. It's the same lie. I'm reading a book called The Game of Gods. It's about, probably about this thick. He goes back to the 60s, the 50s, and traces all the stuff. He's, a, he's an expert on worldviews. And he's an author, and, and he hits it. I'm reading it, and I'm like, whoa, here, here, this is why we're here. This is why we're here. This is why we're here. Re-enchantment. This idea of oneness, um, If you, uh, there's a Christian apologist and social historian. His name is Dr. Peter Jones. Here's how he expresses um, this worldview, a spiritually oriented ideology. In oneism, everything shares the same essence. In a word, everything is the peace of the divine. This is divine. This is, a, this is part of God. He's in this. That's what they tell you. He's in you. And if you just, if you just do the right things, guess what? You're going to find God inside of you. And you will become God. How does the Bible answer this? Sorry, God is separate from us. He's not like us. He's not like anybody. 
He's not even like the sons of God that he created, his heavenly host. He's not like the angels. He's not like you and me. He's different. He's separate. Is God everywhere? Yes. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere at one time. Is he in everything? No. He is not. Can you find him inside of you? No. Because he's separate. He's different. He's totally separate from creation. Man is a fallen creation of God that needs redemption. Redemption that only comes from the creator God, Yahweh, through his son, Jesus Christ. When we get to it, we're going to talk about gods, the word Elohim, which is used in scripture for more than just God. But that's what we translate as God. And there are other Elohims in scripture, but they're not Yahweh. Yahweh is separate. He is different than them all. He created them all. He is the only one who can create. But before God revealed himself to Christ through his word, we couldn't break free from these tyrannies. They, were, they trap us, and even today, they influence us. And they're influencing the church. Reenchantment is really influencing the churches today. It's scary. It is scary. Because it looks right. It sounds good. It's popular. See, it's not only teenagers that are driven by peer pressure. We are too. In truth, we've been held captive to the ways of the world. All three of these are influencing us. We can't think outside the box of any, any more than a jellyfish can think outside the ocean. We think in these worldviews. But what we need is we need the biblical worldview to supersede and overwrite all these things. We're held captive into the ways of the world. And many of us are still influenced by these false worldviews. In the church. I don't just mean the world. I mean in the church. The second tyranny. Whew, we'll see. Second tyranny is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The second tyrant is Satan himself. Beelzebub. The devil. Satan. In Hebrew thinking, um, Satan is, uh, is there's, there's, there's this, this heavens that is the distance between the... Earth, the ground, and heaven. This is the air. This is the, you know, this is the place where uh, Satan exists. It's in the air. That's why he's called the kingdom of the air, the spiritual space between heaven and earth, what I would call the unseen realm. Only because I've read Dr. Michael Heiser, which we'll talk about later. But it's, it, we don't see it. We can't see it. We can't experience it all the time. Every once in a while, we get glimpses of it. And Satan has been at work in us and continues to remain active in every unbeliever. Tempting them with lies and doubts about the existence of God and the truth of his word. That is what he does. He tries to do everything to convince us that this is not true. It's just a book written by a bunch of men over a period of time and they all colluded and it's a lie. Because he wants to win. He knows he can't win but he wants to win and he wants to take as many of us with him. And it's not that believers are possessed by Satan. I've talked about this. We cannot be possessed. We can be oppressed. But we cannot be possessed. And it's not even that non-believers are all possessed. Some of them are. It is possible. But they are willingly persuaded by the lies. Why? Because of their disobedience to God. I mean, we want the lies of the devil to be true. It sounds like fun. Sin is fun. If it wasn't fun, you wouldn't do it. But it's wrong. And it leads to destruction. So we go on sinning. We'll cover more about the powers of Satan and his minions along with the unseen realm when we get to chapter 6. But it is because of the victory of Jesus Christ over death that Paul is writing this letter to the church. He's, saying, he's going to say we've got hope. And ultimately, it's reassuring. For now, we have to understand that our unbelieving relatives and friends, along with all the unbelievers in the world, are gripped in spiritual evil. They've, they've, they've got, it's, it's got them. And guess what? You and I have the answers. It's freedom in Christ. So why do we sit and not tell anybody about it? It's like having the cure for cancer and not telling anybody about it. We should not despair 
Satan was defeated at the cross. He no longer has access to the throne room of God. He is defeated. He's here because it says, whoa, whoa to the earth because your accuser has now come to you. Jesus rules over him. He still rules over him. He can o- Satan can only do what God allows him to do. And one day he will be punished. But we should be arrogant about it. We should be arrogant against those who are, who are still under his influence because they're being lied to. Just like we were when we were his captives. The third one is the tyranny of the passions of the flesh. This, this word flesh uh, does not mean just our physical body. It also means our whole human nature. Remember last week we talked about the heart as the center of, of our thoughts of who we are. It includes that. These cravings include desperate appetites for exploited pornography or selfish luxury, as well as our incurable self-indulgent attention seeking and proud self-glorification. The first thing I talked about, how we are, we are think high, more highly of ourselves than we should. And we covet. And we lie. And we look at things lustfully, not just people, but things. All three of these tyrants place the triple bondage on us. Not only are we unable to break free, but we don't want to break free. As unbelievers, we enjoy our sins, and we even go as far as to boast about them and actually watch programs that glorify them and actually support people who want it to be legal to do them. Or support laws that forbid criticism of them. We defend ourselves from accusations of guilt by claiming that we couldn't help ourselves. I, I, it was just my nature. I couldn't help myself. It's my mom and dad's fault. They're, they're the ones who, who, who raised me. It's their fault. It's not. It's the world. The world just, you know, my circ- you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand my, my I've not been blessed with this or that. I, 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 there is no excuse kids to understand that. I don't care why you didn't do it. You were supposed to do it. No excuse works. We cannot excuse ourselves. Our genetics, our social upbringing, our financial circumstances are not valid excuses. This part of Ephesians confirms that sin is natural to us. It is natural. It's what we do. We were all captive to these worldly systems. We're all captive to Satan. We're all captive to our flesh. We're all guilty before God, and we like it, at least at first, until we realize we shouldn't be liking it. We're all children of wrath. We deserve God's wrath. His wrath is not just some impersonal consequence or a result of God's vindictive rage. God just isn't this mad parent who comes and decides to punish us. His wrath is a result of pure anger towards sin. And he will fairly punish sin. So we'll either spend eternity flooded with God's blessings or we'll be filled, flooded with the torment of his wrath. This is how Jesus describes hell. Mark 9, 48. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Imagine a maggot, a worm in you, eating its way through you, never dying. That's hell. You never die for eternity. Worms gnawing at you for eternity. It's a frightening and agonizing picture. And we'll regret forever that we didn't listen to the gospel. This is how serious the condition is. This is how serious the condition is in the world. These verses reveal humbling truth that I am naturally a sinner. I am naturally not a good person. Without God, I'm spiritually dead. I'm a spiritual zombie walking around with other spiritual zombies, spiritual zombies not even realizing that they're dead. Enslaved to the worldly cultures, enslaved to Satan's influence, and enslaved to the desires of my flesh. I should now be facing eternity suffering in hell. We all desperately, desperately need a Savior. Because we are dead by nature. But, the 
the good news is. Next week, we find out the good news. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. Lord, we are sinful by nature. Influenced by this tyranny that doesn't stop. And even after, Lord, we accept Christ and we've asked for forgiveness, Lord, those, those, that tyranny is still pushing on us. Our worldviews are still influencing us because we live in this world. Satan is still trying to oppress us and our fleshly desires are still pushing on us. We need to put them to death. And Lord, we know, we know the answer is Jesus. Next week we're going to see what he did and, and read all about that and, and study that. That's what gives us hope. Lord, Lord help us to see the influences around us. If, if I see temptation, if I know what my temptations are, I can step around them. Help us to do that. Help us to, to confess our sins one to another. Why? Not so that we can gossip about it and feel better about ourselves because, hey, I'm not like Bob. No. So I can lift my brothers and sisters up in prayer and I can walk with them through it and help them. You provide the way and the means. We need a desire. And you'll provide that too to walk in your ways. Go with us this week, Father. We pray this in your name. Amen. Go in peace. God bless.